Uh, so, uh, good evening, artists uh, and, uh, and animators. Um, it's my pleasure to spend some time uh, with uh, Garrett Kramer. Um, in short, uh, Mr. Kramer is a guy who found out that when he stopped trying to feel better um, and just decided to get on with his life, he found that um, life was actually getting easier. And um, he's the author of the book Still Power, and to me, um, it's about listening to your own wisdom and taking action from a place of mental quiet. Um, and this might be wrong, but uh, I'd like to throw it up anyway. It's um, being free from the belief that your best performance comes from chasing your feeling. Um, so we might jump into that. Um, he's currently uh, about to finish his book, The Path of No Resistance, um, which I will look, I'm looking forward to read, and it sounds... Uh, like a beautiful way to make still power happen consistently and make your travel, uh, your journey on getting a better, becoming a better artist easier. Um, so my goal today is uh, to give Garrett the floor as much as possible so everybody out there, every artist can get a sense of who this guy is, what, what the three principles or state of mind is about and how this might help you. Um, so with that being said, let's, uh, let's kick it off. Good evening or good afternoon, Garrett. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for uh, having me. I appreciate it. Cool. So, to the best of my knowledge, there's very few uh, state of mind or three principal people talking about artists. Um, and I reached out to you because you specialize in performance and sports. And to me, those areas aren't all that different. It's about, like, it's a craft. Um, it's a, it's, it's about. Um, performing and um, and it's pretty hard or it can be pretty hard and uh, yeah let's let's take it from there so so in my introduction did I did I say anything that struck you like oh that's not entirely correct or I would say <laughs> no no <laughs> the words sound the words sounded nice so they uh, they felt they felt right so yeah, it was all it was all good, but no no problems at all. No Sweetness. At all. all right. Yeah. So I, I guess I know a little bit of what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Cool. So I've recorded two state of mind calls where we discuss with other artists how they deal with deadlines, uh, and any questions they had regarding like what do I do when uh, I've got something that needs to be done and I have a deadline or I have to perform better or I have to um, like there's a lot of thinking with this and. Um, we discussed it, and I was wondering, yeah, where are we going to take this? Well, um, well, l l let me, let me, let me maybe help it out, just help you out. So, so, I definitely have some um, some thoughts about what you just said about deadlines and all that. But I think the first thing that struck me in your comments was the um, you know, the relationship between sports performance or athletics and the arts. And I, I, I wholeheartedly agree that there is an, there's a, there's a, a, an awesome connection there, right? So I think, and I think that what people get when it comes to the arts, but they often don't get when it comes to sports is that is the power of that imagination and creativity. So in my work, I use the arts, for example, I use creativity, creative people, imaginative people, which are, are often artists, as examples of what we're looking for on the field of play. So it's almost like I use um, the arts as as an example of, of clarity because artists, best work comes from as we, as i said before imagination pure imagination and that is a result of of consciousness and clarity and what we're looking for in our athletes and the athletes i work with and teach is the same thing is the same thing so i'm pointing them in the same direction and kind of seeing what comes out the other end from there so i think that that there is a there is a direct connection and I think it's an important, an important, important correction connection to talk about. So, um, again, the 
whether it's an athlete on the field of play or an artist at an easel, the the ebb and flow of the person's thinking is going to determine their level of inspiration, their level of passion, their their ability to um, perform, and and nothing else, nothing else. And 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 people in both walks of life who look in that direction, so athletes who look in that direction, and 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 artists who look in that direction, tend to produce better work. And um, that's what my my work, my um, company, my books are all about. It's pointing pointing out to people what's happening behind the scenes in their own heads on a moment to moment basis. If you know how the system works, if you know how the mind works, you tend to live in clarity and um, inspiration, imagination, and a high level of performance more often. Does that make any sense? Um, yeah, completely. Um, and so one of the things that's, that is coming up for um, most of the people that I talk to about this is, and you're probably very familiar with this question, and that comes up is, what do I do when I'm, um, when I'm stuck? Yeah. Because right? everybody knows, at least artists that I know, are very familiar with the zone and what happens when they have mental clarity. And that's probably why they're artists. They love that feeling. Um, yeah. and so well, the, the, well let me make it easy there's, there's a, it's a great it's, it is a common question and it's it's a it's the right question the 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 answer is you keep you keep painting you keep creating you keep playing you keep practicing it's the, it's that simple see there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a, a common misconception that when we get writer's block, when our performance stalls out, when we can't, you know, when we get stuck, that we need to adjust, we need to take a break, we need to clear our heads, we need to go on vacation, you know, take a walk around the block or, or whatever it is. And and there's a there's an absolute misconception in that, that because you can just as easily get stuck taking a walk around the block than you are sitting at your desk writing a book or you know, uh, practicing your golf shots or, 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 or writing a poem or, 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 or a, a piece of music or painting a picture, whatever. So your environment has no bearing on whether you're stuck or not. So, and this is what I teach people. So to back it up a second, it's always understanding why you're stuck. Again, what's happening behind the scenes in your head? It's never the behavioral modification or the or the or the mental technique or trick that that there'll be diminishing returns in those coping strategies. So if so, if I'm writing a book, for example, a chapter in my book, I'm on deadline, as you were saying before or whatever, and I get writer's block. I know. I know that writer's block is the byproduct of a random influx of thought. Random influx of thought. It's not a byproduct of my editor. It's not a byproduct of my deadline. It's not a byproduct of um, um, noise outside. It's not a, it's not a byproduct of um, what my wife uh, made for breakfast this morning. <laughs> it, it, it's a byproduct of a random influx of thought and when thought invades our heads like that we get stuck end of story that's the way it works it doesn't matter what the thought is about the thought could be positive thought negative thought neutral whatever doesn't matter when thought invades the system we feel off we feel insecure we feel anxious we get stuck there's no other reason, none. Now, knowing that is really my ace in the hole because the only answer that being the case is to keep writing. There is no answer to go take a walk in the park because if thought has invaded my head, just because I'm taking a walk in the park, it won't leave my head. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. 
So as I look away from all these potential reasons that I just named, why I might be stuck that are not true reasons, but we make it up. As I look away from that and I get to my writing, naturally, my head will get unstuck. My head will get unstuck. So that's that's what you do. Now, you or people who are listening might say, wait a second. Wait a second, dude. I, I've I've been stuck in it. I've been trying to you know work or create something right, exercise, whatever it may be. And I've been stuck and I have taken a walk through the park or I have changed my environment or I have done a mental strategy, a deep breathing technique or thought positive thinking or something. And I have felt better. So so I don't agree with you. I, I've done that before. And maybe I've gone to meditation class or I've yoga or something. And I have felt better. And people will say that. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't always work going to meditation class. It doesn't always work taking a walk in the park. The reason for that, Hank, is because it never works. That's not what's working. And we get fooled into believing that the outside strategy in order to clear the clutter is what leads to clarity. And that is never the case. Never, ever, ever. It's just a coincidence. What leads to clarity is the mind's natural ability to self-correct, regardless of what you're doing, regardless of what you're doing. In my business, in sports performance, this is rampant. So a sports psychologist will give a player a mental strategy, and the player will go out the next night in his game and play fantastic, just great, right? They'll make this outside in connection. Ah, it was the strategy the psychologist gave me. So the next night they'll employ the same strategy and they'll play awful. Then they'll call up the psychologist and say, I must not have done it right. I must have done it right the other night. I didn't do it right tonight. Can you go over that with me again? And the psychologist will do it and he'll go out to the next game and he'll play awful again. Then he'll say, well, can you give me a new strategy? <laughs> and then that strategy won't work. Or it will work sometimes and not others, even though it's never the strategy that's working, appear to work. And then he'll go to the next sports psychologist because this guy's no good anymore. We've got to go to the next guy and the next guy, the next technique, the next strategy. The horse is out of the barn. Forget about it. We're looking outside. So what I'm saying is that the mind, if we don't look outside and try to fix things, the mind has an amazing ability to fix itself. And the only way to activate that ability is to not do something to feel better, not do something in a quest to cope. If we don't do that, or I should say the degree that we don't do that, because we all do it to a certain degree, but the degree we don't do that will determine our level of consciousness, our level of creativity, imagination, our ability to, to uh, perform uh, with excellence. That is perfectly clear. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's a, see, what we're talking about here is a whole new ball game. It's a, it's a, it's an entirely new paradigm on performance. You know, the old paradigm or the current, I shouldn't say old because it's the way it's the standard, the standard paradigm, at least in athletic performance, is to, if a player is not in the zone, as you said before, and the zone to me is just a clear head, right? If a, if a player is not there, the, the current paradigm is to give the player things to do to get there, right? Well, in order to employ one of these strategies, and strategies could include visualization, uh, positive thinking, as I said, going through routines, deep breathing, uh, thinking of past successes, all these things. In order to employ any of these common uh, mental strategies in sports, the athlete has to do what? The athlete has to think. You can't employ a strategy without thinking. But what we're trying to get to is clarity, a state of no thought or no conscious thought, right? So if there's a disconnect between the strategies of these psychologists and the experiences 
of performers when they're at their best. When they're at their best, they'll use words like, I felt free, I felt unencumbered, I wasn't thinking, it just kind of happened, I don't really know how it happened, I kind of stumbled upon success, all this stuff. But the strategies of the, of the psychologist are totally the opposite of that. They're giving the athlete something to think about. Well, you can't get to a state of no thought by adding thought. And that's what therapy does, that's what um, sports psychology does, that's what reading self-help books does, watching videos, all this stuff. So what we're saying is it's always understanding the understanding how the mind works. It's never the how-to technique. Understanding leads to clarity. Understanding why. Why don't I feel confident today? Well, you don't feel confident today because you've got a lot of thinking going on. And if you tend to that thinking and try to fix that low level of confidence, you're going to have to add more thought and you're going to feel less confident. <laughs> if you simply live your life, live your life naturally, the, your, 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 your head full of thought will wash away, stale thinking out clarity in and all of a sudden boom confidence is renewed that's it that's it when you don't you, people people aren't confident or not confident people they may feel confident or not confident at times i know i do but i again i feel confident when my head's clear i feel insecure unconfident when my head's cluttered you work the same way any successful person or unsuccessful works the same way and that's the direction that we're pointing, pointing people to. A great, a great example of this is small children. Small children can have a temper tantrum, get super insecure, meltdown, and then what happens a second later? Boom, they snap out of it, and they act like it never happened in the first place. Now, their parents look at them and say, man, Little uh, little Jane, two seconds ago, she was freaking out. Now she's the happiest kid on the planet. What's that all about? Why can't I get some of that, you know? Well, what what that is proof of, Hank, is, is the mind's natural ability to fix itself. Little Jane doesn't do a self-help technique. She doesn't go to therapy. She doesn't try to cope. All she does is get on with life and naturally she self-corrects without any effort whatsoever. It's how the system works. As we grow, however, the world is so massively the other way, outside in, giving us things to do and reasons why we feel a certain way and things to do to fix why we feel a certain way, that the misunderstanding in, in, at different levels in all of us tends to accumulate to the point where we, we're, we're looking and blaming everything on the outside for how we feel on the inside. And then we're trying to fix the outside to fix how we feel on the inside. And the more we do that, the more we obstruct this ability, this innate ability to self-correct. That innate ability to self-correct, by the way, another way to term that would be that everyone is blessed with this wonderful psychological immune system. And the more we stay out of that psychological immune system's way, the better we're going to feel on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And so once you do that, you move um, to a place of what you call still power, or you... Well, you... You know, actually, you know, you got you to remember, still power is just the name of a book. Yeah. I don't want people to get caught up, and, and you know, I don't want people to get caught up in, in the word. Still power is just my, my word I made up that kind of... It's just made sense to me. Like, um, still power really means to just, um, uh, it's the opposite of willpower. You know, you can't fight through your lows, even though people will advise that all the time. <laughs> you know, use willpower. Come on, fight your way through this. Find an answer. Grind your way through it. Yada, yada. You can't. So my way of, of saying it was still power is not, not just sitting down and being like a Zen guy or something. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, Live your life. Just don't try to fix things. That's the still part of it. And, and in doing that, 
the, your, your, your innate power to feel better, innate, without effort, will shine through. So that's, that's what still power is all about. And many people misinterpret that. They'll, they think it means like, be still, you know, don't do it, you know, if you feel bad, stop and, and take a deep breath. I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm not not suggesting that. I mean, all I'm saying is, if you're meant to take a deep breath, if you're meant to go meditate, if you're meant to do whatever, walk around the park, you'll just do it instinctively. It, it'll just happen. It'll just happen. You don't have to do it deliberately. It, it won't work deliberately. It, it, instinctively, yes. Instinctively, yes. But not deliberately. I remember my new book, I talk about a time where I did have writer's block. And without, and, and I found myself sitting in the lobby of our office building here. I didn't even, and I, I, I just was in the chair in the office building sitting there. And I was like, shoot, two seconds ago, I had writer's block and I was behind my desk. How did I get here? Well, how I got here was instinctively, I just kind of walked to the office just to, to take a break. But it happened instinctively. It wasn't a strategy. It just happened. And sure enough, I went back to my desk and I was good to go. But it wasn't, it just happened. It's kind of like the, you, you notice, you know, when you make productive changes or productive decisions in your life, you kind of notice them after the fact. You notice them after they've already happened. You don't notice them while you're doing it. Does that make any sense? And I, I tell it to people and they say, ah, oh, that's true. You know, when I met my wife or my husband, yeah, next thing I know, we were walking down the aisle. <laughs> how'd that happen? <laughs> right? Oh, how'd that happen? Well, it was such a natural thing. It was such an instinctive, um, instinctive, um, feeling that you don't even know you're doing it. It's like athletes after great performances that you ask them to recall it. They can't remember it. You know, guy, guy wins the U.S. Open or the, or the, or the British Open the Masters, whatever, and he can't remember it. I'm like, yeah, I, how did I win this thing? I can't believe I, this happened. <laughs> They'll say that all the time because they don't even, they're, 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 head, they're, they're so conscious that they're, it's, it's just happening without effort. So there's no memory of it. Now, their memory of it comes back after thinking and thinking or seeing a television replay or people telling them, but not, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of effort to go back in the past and remember something. That's why it's pretty much ineffective to do it because you're just, you know, it requires so much thought. Hmm. So, um, a small story comes up for me, and, and it reminds me of what you're just saying. I, I asked a, a coffee lady who was having a very good day if she enjoyed if she enjoyed her work, and she said, "Well, I don't think about it. I just I just go to work." And apparently, she had a great time with it. And it, it yeah. sounds uh, it sounds familiar. Um, so so we've been exploring like what not to do or whatever, like and which is basically trying to fix your thinking. Um, what I what I'm curious about is once you see this, once you are aware that if you have a lot of thought, that's all. It's not about the content of the thought. It's just that you have it, and there's no. It's not your job to fix it. Once you see that, what's what is the other end of the spectrum, or is there no end of the spectrum? Is there? There just well, first of all. If you see it, know that there's going to be times when you don't see it. That's number one, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, that just occurs to me. <laughs> yeah. Because it, there's many times, I, I teach this for a living and I don't see it. Right. I know it, but there's, sometimes it gets blurry. It just does. And we could talk about why that is if you'd like. But the all, all I'm saying is, I don't, I don't have a real answer for that. The, the, there's always room for understanding to deepen. Let's just put it that way. So there's no end to, to this understanding. No end, you know? Um, so I, I, I use examples of people in my mind throughout history in, in my new book who, who kind of got it. People like Martin Luther King and Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa, um, like that. But 
there's still even they had they even they missed it at times. So we're oh, we're on this like you say a spectrum of understanding. So if you if if you were to put your your two hands like a foot apart from each other in front of your face, and the right hand was all right. My feelings my feelings come from the outside from my circumstances, and the left hand is my feelings come from the inside from my thinking. Everyone on this planet exists somewhere on that spectrum in of an understanding. So in my case, I, I believe I'm more on the my feelings come from my circ my I'm sorry, my feelings come from my thinking from the inside of me and not the outside end of the spectrum. But there are still times and in some areas of my own life where that's really fuzzy, even though I know in principle it's true. It, it's impossible for feelings to come from the outside. It's, it's impossible. But there's some areas, like, for example, as a parent, for example, I have three children. When I watch them, when I look at their lives or how they're treated by other people or or whether they're happy or sad, all that stuff. Right. I get a little fuzzy about that. I, I sometimes miss that my feelings about that are not coming from my kids lives and what's happening to them. My feelings are coming from the ebbs and flows of my own thinking. And when my head's clear, regardless of what's happening with my kids, I'm going to figure it out. It's going to be all right. I'm going to I may not agree with what's happening, but I'm not going to freak out. I'll, I'll find answers. And when my head's cluttered, it, it could be the end of the world. And I may want to get in there and be tempted to go fix things and fight their their battles or something like that. Right. So so there even though I again, I teach this for a living and I think my level of understanding is is pretty good. There are times where I'll miss it. I'll miss it. So we all exist again on this continuum. Now, an insane person is so on the other end, right? Their feelings, his or her feelings come from his or her circumstances. Don't tell me it's my thinking, man. Look what just happened out there. Look what, look what he said to me. I just got caught off in traffic and I'm mad. I got to go kick that guy's butt, man. I got to, I want to feel better. So if he made me mad. I'm going to go kick his butt. Right. That's an outside in this. That's just a misunderstanding. And unfortunately, unfortunately, most people in the world are more towards that end of the spectrum. In a, we wouldn't the world wouldn't be in the condition that's in if that weren't the case. You, if people knew that their feelings came from the inside, you couldn't have a war. It'd be impossible. Impossible. If feelings come from the inside, you could not have a war. Literally impossible. So, and, and Martin Luther King, by the way, Gandhi, these are great examples of people who spoke to that, spoke to that. Um, so, again, it's, it's not doing something with this understanding. It's upping your level of understanding. It's deepening your level of understanding. And as your level of understanding deepens, what's crazy about it, without effort, your behavior kind of cleans itself up. <laughs> you, you're, you're kind of giving instead of taking. You're you're contributing. You're you're helping. You're um, you you know you're 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 creating. You're you're not um, as I said taking. You're not taking, cheating, stealing, whatever. You're 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 helping others, and that's kind of the you know the direction I'm pointing people. <clears throat> it almost sounds like the definition of bad people sounds like people who believe that uh, their happiness comes from their circumstances and on the other end of the scale the people who are considered good people are um, on to some degree aware of the fact that their their feeling comes from the inside well I think that's I think you know what what I think that you're in the right direction I, I don't I don't and I know you're just I know, I know you probably agree with what I'm going to say. I don't really think there are bad people or good people. I think we're all the same, yeah. but for yeah. our level of understanding. So we're all the same, but for where we fit on that spectrum. So, and, and that really, and I think understanding how the mind works really helps a person not only in their own, um, level of uh, happiness, giving, productivity, uh, love, all that stuff. It also helps a person 
understand the plight of being a human being and understand what people are up against. So the, uh, the current paradigm will point us to circumstance. Well, this guy lives in poverty and, and he's had a tough life and yada, yada. And that's why he's so that's why he's deranged. That's why he's, as you said, a bad person or whatever. But that's totally wrong. I mean, there's many people who grew up in p poverty who are wonderful people, giving people, loving people, contribute to society in a big way. And there's many people who grew up in poverty who take and, 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 and steal and, and whatever. So, and, and same thing with people who grew up in the lap of luxury. It's, there's no bearing on it. The circumstances are absolutely irrelevant. I, they don't even help a little bit. I, I don't. People will say, "Well, they help a little." Um, no, you can't be a little bit in, inside out or outside in. You're inside out. You work from the inside out. The outside is pretty much irrelevant. Irrelevant. Now, again, but for our level of understanding, where we fit on that spectrum I talked about, we're all the same. Another way to say that, Hank, would be we're all born with a clean slate. Now, you may say, well, why do some people start to look outside to explain their feelings and fix their feelings? And people and other people, to a certain degree, don't do that. Why is that? Like, if if, if most two-year-olds, like a baby, a baby who is in the... Um, in the delivery ward, whatever you call it, maternity ward, in the, in the cradle, they have a bunch of babies there and they're crying. None of those babies are saying, I'm crying because the lights are bright. They're not blaming their crying on the bright lights. Or they're not blaming their crying on the fact that it's feeding time. They're not, they don't know to do that, right? <laughs> so no, none of those babies in that who are just born are doing that. Now, along the lines, to a certain degree, everyone does that. Some people to a crazy amount some people to a very little amount why why is that don't look to circumstance don't try to figure out that question because we're never going to figure that out that that question is above my pay grade i don't know i don't know and if i try i do know though that if i try to figure it out i'm going to miss it because i'm going to look at personality i'm going to look at past experience I'm going to look at biology, IQ, all these things. And that's not what my work, this work is about. My work, this work is about. We're talking about things that all human beings have in common. Not where we're different. And in my mind, we're looking at personality. We're looking at behavior. We're looking at these individual characteristics. And in doing that, psychology and even religion to a certain extent, has really gone in the wrong direction. Religion and psychology both used to be the study. Back when they started were the study of the mind, spirit, and soul. And because people couldn't understand that, or it was too simple, they they started looking at people's behavior and trying to trying to analyze people's behavior and judge people's behavior and fix people's behavior. And then, and because of that, in my mind, psychology has failed to help because you cannot modify someone's behavior. It is impossible. And it is one of the reasons why, um, in my mind, um, you know, we're, we're, like I said, the world is kind of in this, in this condition it's in, you know, it's just, you can't tell people what's right or wrong, how to act, how to behave. It just does, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It gives them more to think about. And when you do that, you jam the system even more. Wow. Hmm. So, so, um, geez, that's a lot of taking. Um, to 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 simplify, basically, if you allow me, is that the moment we feel um, what you could call a low state of mind, like you're you're you, you feel bad, basically, you feel poor. Sure. Yeah. You're inclined 
to um, to want to fix that to to help remedy that situation. And right. You wouldn't think of that when you're feeling really well, right? Right. You would never you would never go. Oh, I feel so good. Let's fix that. I need to I need to deal with this. Right. You would also never say. Well, what you might do though. <clears throat> yeah. You may say. Sorry to interrupt you, but what you what you may say is, I feel so good because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. You may do that, and there lies the rub because you don't feel good, you don't feel bad, and you don't feel good because of X, Y, and Z. So, if you take that a step further, would you even say that how you're feeling doesn't really matter? It's just a matter of going the direction you want to go, and that's and a that's a fantastic insight. It, and, and that's like me saying, and, and me saying to a player, it doesn't matter how you're feeling. You can still win this golf tournament. That's right. Exactly right. It doesn't. It's it's it's, it's irrelevant. You don't have control over it. You don't have control over your thinking. And because there's direct connection between your thinking and your feelings, a lot of thinking leads to bad feelings, a little thinking leads to good feelings, there's a direct connection there, you don't have control over your feelings. And then I do know that the more you try to control your feelings, and the only way to control your feelings is through thinking, hmm. You're going to feel worse. Why? Again, you have to add more thinking. And I just said the more thinking you add, the worse you feel. <laughs> it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. And it's a vicious cycle created by people who just don't understand. And it's innocent. The therapists are trying to help, but they're not. They're not. An example of that may be, let's say you had a couple who was going to see a marriage therapist, right? And they have marital issues. They sit down at the, they go to the therapist, and what's the common strategy? Well, husband and wife, or the or the partner, sit across from the therapist, and the therapist says, "All right, let's discuss the problems." Mr. Jones, you start. And Mr. Jones, I don't want to discuss the problems. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, Mr. Jones is pretty insightful. Because Mr. Jones knows intuitively that the more he discusses the problems, the more thought he adds. And guess what? The worse this marriage becomes. That's why couple therapy doesn't work. It has like a 92% failure rate. And what's even more interesting is that I think it's like 89% of the therapists have been divorced themselves. Hmm. Now, that may sound funny, but... The bottom line is the therapists are employing the same outside in strategies in their own relationships as they are with their clients, and it's not working on either end. Right? Yeah. Now, so what would work? Well, what would work is taking the husband without the wife, teaching him what we've talked about in this conversation, teaching him that his wife doesn't cause his feelings, his thinking does. And as he looks inside, guess what's going to happen? his level of consciousness, his feeling state is going to improve. Then you take Mrs. Jones and you do the same thing. Now you've got Mr. and Mrs. Jones both operating from a higher level of consciousness. They feel better. Guess what happens to all those marital problems? You tell me. Guess what happens from a higher state of consciousness? What happens? Well, I've read too many books on this. They, they, they don't discuss their problems. They intuitively do what's right. Well, but even before that, the problems wither away. They're, they're gone. They don't exist anymore. They're, 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 they're smoke. They're thought. They come from thought. They're an illusion. They don't exist. They're gone. You know, I mean, I've been married 23 years, and I know that when my head's all jammed up, I look at my wife like, what have I gotten myself into? Even 23 years later. I got. A, I can list a thousand problems with my marriage, and when my head is clear, I can't name one. And my wife hasn't changed one iota. <laughs> right? That's just the way it works. That's the point. So you can't discuss problems that are that are a byproduct of thinking anyway. They're gone. They just go away, man. And what happens to the clarity? 
Answers fill the space. Answers fill that space. Insights, wisdom, love, understanding fills the space. You know? So we're just looking in the wrong direction. You know? It's just, it's just so, and this is, this understanding, Hank, is hiding in plain sight. It's all over the place. We just, people don't know what to look for. When the Beatles write a song called Let It Be, we got to listen. It's wisdom. It's pure wisdom. It's everywhere. You know? It's everywhere. I was listening to this song the other day by, um, oh, my God, what was the song? Um, oh, by, um. Uh, I think it was by Steely Dan or someone, and it was um, uh, something like when the demons are at your door, in the morning you wake up and they're not there no more. Well, that's pure wisdom. What 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 the what the what the artist is saying is is if you don't tend to your demons, they go away. If you don't answer the door, they, they're not there. They go away when you wake up. They're not there anymore. If you tend to them, if you let them in and entertain them, you're screwed. That's pure wisdom, man. Pure wisdom. And, and whether the, whether the, whether the writer, songwriter knew what he was saying or not, he, he knew intuitively. I'm not sure he could have described it, but it's still, it's still pure wisdom. And this kind of wisdom is, is hanging around all over the place. And, and the wisdom is not telling us, Hey, invite the demon in. And let's sit and chat and try to figure it out, analyze. Let's look at your past. Let's look at your future. Let's psychoanalyze your life. It's not that that's 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 utterly the opposite of wisdom. But that's what therapists and life coaches and um, sports psychologists in my field, that's what they're doing. They're doing exactly that. And it's it's when you see it, when you see it for what it is, you'll start to notice this this wisdom. One of my mentors used to say, um, you know, wisdom, it's, wisdom isn't hiding from us. It's us that's hiding from wisdom. It's, it's there. It's there. And through all the noise and all the outside in misunderstanding that's thrown at us every day, it's there if you know what to look for and you stop looking at, at the outside in misunderstanding. I'll give you an example of outside in misunderstanding. For example, like I was watching 60 Minutes here in the States, the, the show 60 Minutes. And they interviewed the chairman of Google, right? And he said that they painted their conference rooms orange. Why? Because orange stimulates creativity. That is rubbish. It's pure rubbish. Orange has no ability to stimulate creativity. I don't care what the data says. There is no way that if I work for Google, I would be creative every single day I walked into the office uh, with my room if it was painted orange. Some days I'd be creative. Some days I wouldn't. Orange would just be orange. That's the way it, it cannot. That's at that's that's just an outside in misconception. Period. I heard another um, psychologist talking about the children of divorce. She said the other day, the children of divorce tend to experiment with drugs more often and sex more often and stuff, errant behavior more often. What? How's that? So divorce, divorce, your parents being divorced has the power to make a child experiment with drugs? How does that work? It's just total rubbish. It's not true. Now, the data, by the way, may suggest that it's true. But data shows correlations, not cause and effect. Sorry, there's no way that's true. It's impossible. Impossible. So, what, well, you know, bottom line, man, my work and our work in this field is to point people to how the system works. We work from the inside out, not the outside in. And we are, we are sure that the more people see that to be true, the more productive and genuine and compassionate and resilient and loving their life becomes. And that's, you know, that's why I've, I've really dedicated my life to this, to this understanding and this work. Hmm. So the, the, the final question that I have, um, 
is if there is an artist out there who hears this and it's like, okay, there's there's something here for me. I'd like to know more. Would you recommend that they start with your book Still Power? Would they recommend like like read anything or maybe maybe it's time for them to read the path of no resistance or maybe maybe <laughs> for <laughs> no, of course they need to get both but <laughs> oh no 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 well no I, I don't well first of all these are these are just books and there's other really cool books out there you know uh, Jamie Smart my my mate Jamie Smart wrote a book called Clarity which is cool Michael Neal another colleague of mine wrote a book called the uh, the Inside Out Revolution these are all good 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 books Sid Banks has a a bunch of you know a uh, bunch of good books out there but the the books the books only point the reader in a direction. Right, the books are just filled with words. They're not filled with truth, and you have to know that going in. So, if you're going to read these books trying to find an answer, you're going to miss the answer, because the answer lies within the person that you just mentioned. Right. So, my my role is to bring out that inner wisdom in the person, not to not to uh, instill it. There's a big difference there. Again. My role is to bring out what the person already knows intuitively. Now, it may be covered up, and again, it's covered up in all of us to varying degrees, but my role is to is to kind of help the person wipe away the outside and misunderstanding and bring out what they know to be true, which is they they have a thought that produces a feeling. Something happens on the outside, that's not what produces the feeling. Intuitively, like I talked about those small children before, everyone knows that to be true. So my role, my colleague's role, is to bring out that innate wisdom that rests within every single person on this planet. I don't care how evil someone may seem; this still, it's still in there, and it can never be, it can never be totally extinguished. It's not possible. It's in there. Now, reading these books just points in a direction. In a direction, and, and I am very clear in the in the in the beginning of my books to tell the reader that, like, just take your time. If you're not getting it, it's cool, and it's just something I. It's just a direction that you can consider, and then see what happens. Right now, if someone is listening to this and says, you know, this sounds really cool, how could I learn more about this? The the my the easy response to that is they can send me a note. They can email me or pick up the phone and call me. It's not complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't complicated, right? <laughs> I mean, they can call me anytime. It's, we'll talk about it. But again, what I'm going to do is we're just going to point back the person back inside, you know. But I'm happy. At, like, you know, you reached out to me. This is not complicated. And, and by the way, you'll find, at least it's my opinion, that you'll find that people who understand how the mind works, they're the most uh, available, they're not running around like chickens with their heads cut off. They may have a lot to do, so to speak, but they find time. Hmm. So, 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 so anyway, the, the point of it is, you know, there's always time and there's always this, this, you know, we're always should be there for each other. And if someone wants to learn about this, they should, you know, send me an email or pick up the phone, go to my website. It's all there and just call me. It's not, or send me an email. We'll, we'll we'll talk about it. It's not it's not complicated. I can tell from experience after reading uh, the book Clarity by the excellent Jamie Smart that I had a sense for what he was talking about. I didn't get it. I did. Yeah, I, I, I did hire a student of his, uh, Angus Jane, and good that student. yeah, it's a good student. Yeah. And that conversation was what changed it for me because it's there you go. Yeah. But but be clear, Ankush, who I met two years uh, almost two years ago now, when I taught for Jamie, um, Ankush, it, it was a guy who had no idea that this even existed, and when it when it when he heard it, the stars just kind of aligned. You know what I'm saying? Like it just happened that he just his head was just super clear. Whether it was Jamie or me, because that was, I, I taught on Ankush's first class, first, um, when oh, he first, yeah, that's true. I, was, I was the teacher. So whether, however it happened, the stars just aligned and Ankush says like, holy smokes, this is 
whoa, right? And he had this incredible revelation and insight. And 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 I I remember saying to Jamie, keep an eye on him because he he's going to be a quick study. And and that and I just happened to guess right, you know. So so yeah, you're right. And I think that um, it's very common to read a book like Clarity and say, wow, something in here is different. I'm not quite sure what it is. Let me see what can, let me, let me see how I can explore this. And then you spoke to Ankush, and sure enough, the feeling between the two of you is what pushed you in the right direction. So it's always the feeling. Always yeah. look at the feeling. It's not the words. There's no truth in words. So you can't find a feeling in words. Look for a feeling. There's always truth in that. I think we come to a really nice place. Um, is there anything else you'd like to discuss or, or get across? No, but um, I think I'm talked out for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, man. I think I'm going to go hit some golf balls or something. Right. Cool. <laughs> Okay, Craig, thank you so much. I'm going to make sure that people are going to be able to find you. Um, and I would wholeheartedly recommend that they do if they feel there's something there for them. Um, 